Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Aqua Lunar Challenge webinar um, on understanding water uh, purification. What, pardon me, understanding terrestrial water purification and the lunar environment. Um, we're really excited to share this webinar with you today in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency. Next slide, please. rundown of how today's session will go. We'll start um, with some introductions and context setting. After that, we'll provide um, an overview of current terrestrial water purification technologies that are known to purify some of the contaminants that are found in the um, lunar water. Then the Canadian Space Agency will provide an overview of Canada's role in lunar exploration and provide an overview of the lunar environment. And then we're gonna jump into a 30 minute moderated Q&A. And for this Q&A session, we do ask that you use the um, Q&A function to submit your questions. Please don't add them to the chat um, because they may get missed. So if you wanna ensure that your questions get answered, um please submit them there and then we'll wrap up with some closing remarks next slide please um so before we get started it's with gratitude and respect that i acknowledge the lands on which foresight operates are the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the first nation inuit and metis peoples and for myself I'm joining from Salmon Arm, BC, the traditional territory of the Sowetmuk. Next slide, please. So here's our panel of speakers for today. We have Chris Patterson, an engineer on the food production team in lunar exploration in the lunar exploration program at the Canadian Space Agency. We have Meg McDonald. Challenge Prize Fellow of Strategic Planning, Engagement and Innovation at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, we have Francis Valencourt, Global Product Manager of Services and Water Tech Expert from Veolia. And myself, Anissa Marschuk, Program Manager of Innovation Challenges here at Foresight. Uh, so before we get into today's uh, session, a bit of background on Foresight. So Foresight is Clean Tech Innovation and Adoption Accelerator. And we have a big audacious goal for Canada to be the first G7 country to reach net zero. Uh, to achieve this, we bring together clean tech innovators, industry partners, um, government, academia, and investors to identify, commercialize, and adopt the clean technologies needed to address um, climate challenges and uh, transition to a green economy. And how we plan to get there is through collaboration and action-oriented support um, in these four, with a focus on these four um, areas. So we have venture acceleration, where we support companies um, at different stages and sectors to accelerate scale and commercialize their technology solutions. We have innovation challenges, which is um, the Aqua Lunar Challenge is uh, an example of an innovation challenge. Um, and this is where we accelerate the adoption of clean tech by working to match industry and government partners with clean tech innovators. Um, we create regional and sector specific ecosystems. Um, in which clean tech can thrive. So connecting the partners that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, so innovators, industry, investors, government, and academia, and really trying to build those, um, those ecosystems up. And then we also are big promoter, promoters of knowledge sharing. Next slide, please. So, Foresight's venture acceleration includes our next networks, which bring together sector specific innovators to work to, uh, together towards a sector uh, related net zero goal. Each of our next programs, which are listed here on the slide, uh, works with innovators to take their products to the marketplace by providing um, industrial market or technology specific training 
sector specific data collection and ecosystem mapping. Um, we provide mentorship, investor matchmaking opportunities, and also um, host different networking events. Next slide. Um, and since this is um, a water related challenge, um, I'll provide a bit more context on our Water Next. So our Water Next program is Canada's Water Technology Acceleration Network. So we work across multiple sectors from mining to municipalities to advance water innovation. And again, we're really just focused on bringing stakeholders together to build Canada's water innovation ecosystem to accelerate um, the commercialization as well as the adoption of water solutions in Canada. And within this Water Next ecosystem, we have a goal um, to achieve less than 10% um, municipal and industrial water loss by 2033. Next slide, please. So the goal of this webinar is to provide some background information on current terrestrial water purification technologies as well as um, provide information on the lunar environment conditions to support you, the innovators, in um, understanding how terrestrial water purification technologies could be adapted um, for use in, um, on the lunar surface for treating water. So I'm going to pass it over to Meg from the Canadian Space Agency. Um, to provide a bit of background on where the need for this aqua lunar challenge came from and from there we'll get into the terrestrial water purification technologies and um, provide an overview on the lunar environment so over to you meg thanks anisa so nice to virtually meet all of you uh, my name is megan mcdonald um, and i am a challenge prize fellow i've been with the csa for almost a year and a half now uh, working exclusively on challenge prizes. So on uh, developing uh, the Aqua Lunar Challenge and then also on the implementation of the Deep Space Food Challenge, which is actually uh, wrapping up uh, sadly in the next couple of months. So on this slide, I just wanted to quickly chat a little bit about uh, the contaminants um, that uh, you'll see are in our applicant guide uh, for the challenge. And these contaminants are expected to be uh, considered as part of uh, your development of your solution. And then uh, we'll go through some slides in terms of terrestrial water purification technologies. And then I'll come back, I'll join and talk a little bit about uh, Canada's role in lunar exploration, um, provide an overview on the challenge and then hand it over to my colleague Chris who will talk a little bit about the lunar environment. So chatting about uh, these contaminants up here on the slide. So you'll notice that as part of the challenge uh, prize development we focused in on a few of the many contaminants uh, that were found uh, as part of the LCROSS mission. So when we came up with the list of contaminants, we actually used a data source uh, from the LCROSS mission, which was a mission that occurred in 2009 uh, and essentially impacted a uh, permanently shadowed region uh, in the Cabeas Crater on the moon to try to identify uh, if there's the presence of water ice on the lunar surface and also to identify if there are any other compounds uh, or contaminants that are present as well. And it found uh, quite a few contaminants uh, present based on this one single uh, ground truth uh, data set. So the reason that we only chose a handful of the many contaminants that are present uh, in uh, the LCROSS mission data set um, are to try to reduce complexity for the challenge, um, also to have some relevance from a terrestrial context as well. Um, and also note that we mentioned in the application guide on our website that we're expecting you to try to consider removing all of these contaminants, but you don't need to necessarily remove all of them as part of your solution. The efficiency and the efficacy of how you can remove the contaminants is also a really important consideration. And we want you to start thinking about how you can try to develop solutions and technologies that ideally can um, eventually remove all of these contaminants uh, as part of your solution throughout the challenge. But we'll also support you uh, throughout the, the later stages in the challenge in terms of refining those technologies as much as we possibly can. Next slide. Hi, everyone. My name is Francis Vianco. I work for a company called Violia. Uh, Violia is the world's biggest uh, company, water company 
in uh, in water treatment in a, in an environment. It was about two hundred thirty thousand employees uh, globally. Uh, so we are uh, focused on environmental uh, problems and solving uh, the uh, try, find, finding solutions for them. Uh, Omodo is resourcing the wells. So um, with and I am a product manager for services for uh, in uh, in for that company globally. So I'm going to talk about a few of the technologies. Uh, the list is not exhaustive, so there are more technologies that are possible to treat uh, the contaminants that are found um, that I can explain. Some of those contaminants, um, when I first started to prepare for this presentation, I, uh, I was surprised to see that some of the contaminants are uh, organic-based, so no, so just, uh, it's all of my expertise to see where they're coming from, but you know these are, contaminants we are used to see in the, in the, in the water treatment. So it, it's kind of a good thing to, uh, to good approach to use the current technologies to treat those, um, those, uh, those contaminants. So with that in mind, uh, you can see some filtration technologies are listed here and, uh, the most, uh, widely used technologies right now, the, where we build most of our new plants is, uh, micro and filtration membranes. Uh, it's a mechanical process, so we saw, uh, those are typically allofiber membranes with uh, pores on them. So we, by size exclusion, we are removing particulate matters, and the pores are ranging from like 0 0.1 to 0 0.01 micrometers. So we remove um, anything from uh, uh, bacteria to uh, organics, uh, often organics that cause color in water. So fumic, uh, fluvic acid and humic acid. The, the application of those uh, all those membranes are, are for water purification. Uh, well, also we use them for any type of other products like uh, beer filtration, water filtration, um, wine filtration, uh, milk filtration, and uh, they can be made with polymer uh, in a hollow fiber, like a straw type of, of material or uh, in the ceramic. Uh, so that's con that's what actually is being used uh, on the space station right now. Um, the second one is, so this is a, one of the big the biggest one here. And so the, the other one, the carbon filter is more like an, an absorption technology. So carbon filter uh, is um, uh, something like a powder or a, a granules that uh, are made from different type of material like a, uh, coal, uh, coconut shell, or even petrol base, coke. Um, and the, the absorption process works as we send water through it. And there's so much, so many paths that water can take that contaminants get lost and a little bit like a sponge. Now that there's so many ways that water can go, uh, water will eventually get through the other side, but the, the contaminants get stuck in, in the, the little, uh, surface area, for example, you know, and this is what you imagine how, how, how much surface area there is uh, in this type of material, a pound, a low, uh, half a kilogram of, of uh, carbon will usually have enough surface area uh, that's equivalent to 35 acres or about 100 football field. Uh, so in just a pound of material, so this the the, the amount of surface area is really immense. And typically, when the the medium is exhausted, you re uh, you regenerate it by uh, eating or you discard it. Another one uh, interesting technology is called green filter. Green filter are a catalytic process. So we send uh, water with uh, iron and manganese contaminants, some hydrogen uh, sulfide as well that we've seen uh, is, is present in the uh, lunar surface. So we send uh, those uh, this water through the green sun filter. Green sun is, uh, green sun is, is, a, is a permanganate coated material. So it's, a, it's, it's manganese that we treat manganese with. And also we remove manganese with manganese. It's a, it's a catalytic uh, process. So we, um, we oxide, the manganese in the, in the water uh, by jumping it through uh, the manganese on the green sun. And this is regenerate itself, no? It's just a catalytic. So uh, it is uh, it is used widely used for groundwater application in, on Earth here. 
uh, and it's very low technology, low key, and very well uh, understood process. So these are the first uh, filtration technology that per se, if we move to the next slide, we'll see um, uh, the next one, which is uh, the membrane processes. Uh, the first one is reverse osmosis. Uh, you probably have heard of this before. Uh, you, we use a reverse osmosis for all kinds of application. Uh, typically, these are flat sheet membranes uh, that we roll together, uh, a little bit like you roll a roll of toilet paper um, to uh, to show you the to have the the the, the image uh, there. So it's um, these are cylinders we we uh, we add to. Uh, to, that we use to to treat um, uh, to in, involve to put in a system. So the process is a little bit different than when what we use with uh, micro nitrogen filtration because you know the pressure we use are uh, much higher. Uh, we call them uh, instead of having holes on the membrane, it's actually we use a thin film. So it's a tiny layer of material, and there's no real hole in, in the membrane. It's just we force water through the material itself. Uh, and uh, the ion stays on the other side, so we remove salts from the water. The pressure needed to do that depends really on how much salt you have in the water. So if you put that under your kitchen sink, you'll have uh, a very low pressure. You can use a city water pressure. Uh, but if you do try to remove uh, sea, uh, treat sea water, for example, where uh, uh, the salinity is much higher, then you'll need as much as a thousand psi or seventy bar to uh, to operate so the and and this is what we do currently uh, in many many places in the world usually the water loss is very high using this technology so we use multiple passes uh, we use uh, ultrafiltration as a pretreatment and we can use electro uh, deionization on the post treatment as well um that uh, brings me to electro deionization which is another membrane process uh, this is where we use electrodes to create um, an anode and a cathode uh, and to create a differential in, in uh, polarity in the water. And we put two membranes in between, or two, five, or like many, um, to in between those. So the ions uh, that are present in the water are trying to migrate to uh, the cathode and the anode. And um, uh, the water molecule will stay in between the two membranes because the membranes will will only allow uh, anions and or cations to to move. Uh, there, are, this is a this is a really great technology. It's been used since the sixties. the The downside is that it, it, it uh, you need it, the anodes are just, or the cathodes are usually sacrificial, so it means you need to um, change them, and. Um, uh, it's polishing more technology. You know? So you use it in combination with reverse osmosis. Uh, if not, you're going to change your cathode or anode all the time. Uh, the last one uh, on this page is called membrane degasification. Uh, we've seen in the contaminant that present in, in the, on the linear surface that some of them are volatile organic compounds. So they are stuck in the, in the on the moon right now. But as soon as uh, we warm the ice. Uh, they're gonna form gases, so, so you gotta need to remove uh, those gases. Uh, just not let them go uh, in the air. It may be poisonous, like hydrogen sulfide. So the way we uh, we could do that uh, is by membrane degasifications, and and we use a, a membrane that's called hydrophobic. That hydrophobic is meaning you you don't like water. Uh, you uh, you afraid of water. That's what's that's what it means. And uh, it's the hydrophobicity is so high that uh, it's just going to repel water, and and um, the gases will move to the membrane, and our uh, it will go through the membrane itself. Another example of hydrophobic materials are Gore-Tex. Uh, if you live on the west coast like me, everyone has a Gore-Tex, or you know a wax, freshly waxed car. You see the the water on the on the on the surface of this material it forms. Like a, 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 a like a bubble, no, it's a, a spherical a shape. It's not like a um, when the cortex is, is is very old. You see the all the the car has not been waxed in a while. You see the water is more like a, a Le mountain, whereas it's not a, a spherical. Anyway, so that's the that's the way to describe a phobic membrane. Uh, on the next slide, we see um, uh, the two more. Um, 
uh, technologies. Uh, Iron Exchange Resin is actually what I do most now in my current role um, uh, as a as a service. We go to plan to to companies that uh, need uh, to uh, to remove their uh, to have a water need, um, and we uh, we place um, a specific reason for their need. No? So that the the resins is is uh, is made out of a polystyrene material. And uh, air, um, let me out there. It's uh, polystyrene mixed with crosslink with divinyl benzene beads. So it's a it's a poly it's like it's, it's a it's a specific polymer that uh, we uh, we exchange resin. Uh, we exchange onions and cotton with what's a current the what's in the water you want to exchange it with. So. Uh, we use the polarity of the contaminants to match it with uh, with specific um, uh, armless onion or calcium that we have in those resins. For example, you know we use some kind of the process is the same for softeners, you know. So where we use uh, salt like uh, in ACL uh, sodium chloride to remove calcium carbonate CaCO3. So you remove the you, you take the calcium. Uh, and you replace it with sodium, which is armless, and we remove the carbonate CO3, uh, and remove and you replace it with uh, chloride Cl, which is armless as well. So this is the way we uh, we kind of uh, we use resin. The neat thing is uh, we can target specific contaminants by using a specific uh, resin generation process where the resin will have the exact same match that you target the contaminant you are trying to remove. The downside is is that you need to regenerate that resin uh, often, and it's fairly more expensive than uh, having a, a full scale uh, treatment plant. The last one is called differential permeation. Um, this is more um, for someone who's been in the industry for twenty years, like me. Uh, it's more like a marketing term, uh, but uh, this is where we use selective membranes. So we it's possible these days to create a membrane. Uh, that will be able to uh, to selectively, uh, if there is not many uh, uh, contaminants that look the same, no? so if, to remove the contaminants that you target. Um, so uh, typically, those the shape factors of the membranes are the same one in our membranes. Uh, so they are a flat sheet that you roll on itself. Um, and uh, the infrastructure is actually the same. So that's the neat thing about it. No? So if you are always having difficulty operating, so then you can try using a selective membrane. Finally, uh, on the last slide, uh, we got, and this is a slide I'm going to read to you, uh, the technology that we have uh, seen through today uh, capable of treating all the contaminants found in, in lunar water. Um, there are way more contaminants we used to uh, deal with on Earth here. Uh, so the, the current technology should be able to treat whatever uh, is present in, in, on the moon. The innovation in achieving preferred water in the fewest treatment step possible and limiting the use of resources such as electricity, heat, uh, energy, water, and chemicals uh, will uh, support the advancement of terrestrial water technology in developing the circular economy of water, minimizing the footprint and advancement and decentra decentralized treatment. And decentralized treatment is, is one of the, the push for the industry uh, within Canada, actually. So we need to treat uh, uh, all, all in even those that are far away from a big city. From a technical perspective, the Aqualunar Challenge presents an opportunity to advance these terrestrial water technology by contributing to circular water solutions, support and development of robust membrane technologies, recover uh, products of water for on-site reuse, and reuse cost of ownership through compact, modular, and reliable water treatment system. And that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly um, chat a little bit about Canada's role in uh, lunar or moon exploration and then provide a couple of slides uh, with uh, an overview of the challenge um, and then hand it over to my colleague uh, Chris to talk a little bit about uh, lunar conditions and the lunar environment. So um, 
it's wild to think, but over 50 years ago, uh, human beings first stepped uh, on the moon, on the lunar surface. And after maintaining a continuous human presence uh, aboard the ISS, the International Space Station, for over 20 years, um, we're now getting ready to return to the moon. Um, and this time, the goal of this major international collaboration in human space exploration is to send folks deeper into space um, than we ever have been. So as I'm sure so many of you are aware, Canada will be part of this milestone in human space exploration uh, with the Canadian astronaut flying to the moon on the historic Artemis uh, II mission. So that's of course a part of NASA's Artemis program, which is a multi-mission campaign that will push human space exploration uh, to the moon and onto Mars. Next slide, please. Um, so quickly chatting about some of the Canadian contributions to spe space exploration and starting with the NASA-led Artemis program. So um, they are multi-missions and they're increasingly complex missions and, and they really will lay the foundation for sustainable human and robotic exploration of the moon uh, and to Mars. So like the Apollo program over 50 years ago, Artemis really starts with missions around the moon before a mission that lands on the lunar surface. Um, so Artemis 1 uh, was a successful uncrewed test flight that took place in 2022. Um, and next is Artemis 2, which is planned uh, for launch no earlier than September in 2025. And as I mentioned, uh, as many of you I'm sure know, a Canadian will make history by flying around the moon, and that Canadian is Jeremy Hansen. Um, and we also have uh, Jenny Gibbons as a backup um, astronaut for uh, Jeremy as well. Uh, and Jeremy is part of the Artemis uh, II flight um, because of Canada's contribution to the Lunar Gateway. So for folks who may not be aware, the Lunar Gateway um, is a small sta space, space, space station that will orbit around the moon. Um, so currently the ISS is orbiting around the Earth uh, and the Lunar Gateway uh, will orbit around the moon. And it's about one sixth of the size of the ISS and will include modules for science, for research, uh, and will also have some living quarters for crews of four astronauts. Uh, and lastly, uh, in terms of Canadian contributions, uh, a really important one, uh, the Canada Arm 3. So uh, Canada Arm 3, it's a highly autonomous Canadian robotic system, and it will perform tasks on the Lunar Gateway without human intervention. Um, so it will work autonomously and will be used to maintain and repair and inspect the Lunar Gateway, to relocate gateway modules, and to help astronauts during spacewalks, uh, and of course enable uh, science in lunar orbit. Next slide, please. And another important Canadian contribution um, for lunar exploration is uh, the Canadian lunar rover. So we are sending a rover to the moon. Um, so the development, launch, and operation of a Canadian rover uh, was an exciting technology that was actually um, funded under the Lunar Exploration Acceleration Program as part of the Canadian Space Agency. So Canadensis is building the rover and it's developing its Canadian uh, payloads. And this science rover will be designed to survive a lunar night, which Chris will talk about uh, in a few slides, um, which lasts 14 Earth days and uh, is extremely cold and dark and quite difficult uh, to survive. Uh, we'll explore the moon's south pole to find water ice uh, and will be sent to the moon no earlier than 2026. And the reason we wanted to talk a little bit about Canada's role in lunar exploration is because it all fits into um, the challenge prize. When we're thinking about long-term uh, human space exploration, when we're thinking about more ambitious space missions, part of this requires a shift um, to start looking at resources in space for use in space, because we know that resupply missions are uh, incredibly costly, very logistically difficult. Uh, so as we're starting to engage in more ambitious space missions uh, to the moon, to Mars and beyond, we need to start thinking about ways that we can uh, sustainably use resources in space uh, for, for use uh, to sustain a longer term human presence. So that's when we start chatting a little bit about ISRU, which is in situ resource utilization. So um, it aims to support sustainable space exploration uh, through the reduction of resupply missions. Um, and the activities under in situ resource utilization can include resource assessment, extraction, processing, transportation, construction, and storage. Uh, so when we're situating uh, the Aqua Lunar Challenge within the umbrella of ISRU, we would really start looking at it in the processing uh, activity within the ISRU umbrella. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please, sorry. 
Okay, so to chat a little bit about uh, the challenge. Um, so this is the challenge prize statement. Um, I will link uh, the applicant guide in the chat as well. But the goal here is to really um, start creating some innovative technologies for use on the lunar surface to remove contaminants that are found in in situ lunar water. Um, and I chatted about uh, the group of contaminants that we picked from the, the, the larger group of contaminants uh, found in the LCROSS mission. And we're also hoping that um, these solutions may also support or advance uh, water purification technologies here on Earth. Next slide, please. Um, so just uh, considering time, I won't spend too much time on the mission scenario, but I just wanted to focus on these next two slides. Uh, this one's uh, chatting about the lunar conditions that we outline in the mission scenario, and the next is looking at constraints. And some of the points that I wanted to, to really um, emphasize here is that um, we know that in a three-year challenge, um, it can be extremely complex and difficult to be able to design and test systems that um, can entirely work on the lunar surface. Um, but what we are really hoping for is that you are designing and accounting for and considering um, the lunar and space environment when you are um, preparing and drafting your design concept reports to apply for the challenge. So how are you going to consider um, adjusting your systems to be able to try to uh, survive the lunar night, for example, these kinds of pieces. So we're not expecting you to already create systems immediately that can do this. We just really want you to start considering it and trying as much as possible to integrate them into uh, your design report and ultimately your systems. Next slide, please. And then from a constraints perspective, you'll notice that there was a deliberate decision here not to include specific mass, volume, and power uh, constraints. So we're really putting the assumptions on you as innovators to tell us how you're reducing your power, your mass, your volume, so that your systems are space ready. And you'll have to make some assumptions on your part to do that. Um, and that's okay. That's what we're looking for when you're applying for this challenge. Um, is to try to start focusing on if you already have a solution, a terrestrial solution, how will you adapt it to be space ready? If you're creating a new solution, what are some considerations that you are putting in place to make sure that your that the solution can fit on a lunar lander, for example, um, or that it can be used on the lunar surface? So these are all really just considerations that we're hoping that you'll take into account when you're starting to design um, your concept report and then ultimately build uh, your prototype hopefully as part of the challenge. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to my uh, colleague and friend, Chris. Thank you, Meg. Have my camera shutter on there. Everyone wants to see me. <laughs> so um, yeah, thank you everyone. So as you might imagine, uh, the initial assumption when we were speaking about water being found on the moon is that it wasn't in fact there. Um, this is pretty intuitive. If you ever looked at the thing, it's this big, boring gray ball of dust up there. Um, but that was found to be potentially inaccurate. Um, so in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, um, some missions were sent to the moon to try to detect what may actually be in the regolith or the moon dust. Um, the data that was sent back during those missions is still considered to be inconclusive. However, it did point to the fact that there could potentially be some moisture or some water in the regolith. Um, so that was fairly exciting to see, even if it wasn't entirely conclusive. Um, but that all changed in 2008 when an Indian mission uh, definitively detected water for the first time on the lunar surface. This was, of course, even more exciting because now we, we knew for sure it was there. And so additional missions that were sent after that one, uh, the Lunar Prospector, LCROSS, the LRO, um, were tasked with performing remote sensing observations. So this is a spacecraft that remains in lunar orbit and uses radar to try to detect where water could be. Um, and those missions were also able to detect water in what are called permanently shadowed regions, um, or PSRs. These are typically deep craters on the lunar surface, particularly in polar regions, um, where right at the bottom of the crater or in certain regions of it, um, sunlight is never able, able to enter. So that means for millions or even billions of years, these locations on the lunar surface have been not exposed to sunlight, and that's where the water likes to really um, hang out on the lunar surface. Now, LCROSS in particular had a very important job, and it was to search for secondary compounds that could be found in the lunar water. Um, as Meg listed a few of them, it was able to actually find that there are some contaminants, um, and it's not just pure water. Uh, so those are some compounds that you're going to be tasked with removing as part of the challenge. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we spoke a little bit about how we actually find water on the surface. Um, there are several ways of doing this, but we're just going to go over a few here for your reference. Um, the first of which, as I mentioned, is what's called remote sensing. So this is using radar to scan the lunar surface and look for the water's return signature to the instrument to see whether or not water can be present. Um, as I mentioned, this can be done by orbiters such as the LRO um, in low lunar orbit. However, it can also be done from Earth using radar observatories here. Um, it's not always super accurate, so I don't think we typically like to say for certainty whether water is in a particular location by using remote sensing, but it does a reasonably good job at covering a large area of territory and seeing, okay, where in this potential operations area could we find water resources with reasonable certainty, but you don't want to, you want to go there and really make sure once you know where it could be. And that's where these other options come in. So the other option that you can use is, what, is what's called a deep impact analysis. Um, this is usually a pair of spacecraft that go to the moon together. One of them quite literally hurls itself into the lunar surface at high speed in order to, to produce an ejecta plume that the secondary sister spacecraft then analyzes to see if there's a water signature in it. And that tells you fairly accurately whether or not there is water in that particular site. Um, the gold standard, however, is actually going and landing on the surface. So this is what's called in situ volatile sniffing. This is using usually a, um, a mobile robotic platform equipped with a spectrometer of some sort in order to detect volatiles, water, all sorts of other things um, actually on the surface in real time. Um, there's actually a NASA mission coming up called Viper. You may have heard of that rover. It's going to be going to the South Pole in a few years. It's going to be equipped with an instrument called Nervous, and Nervous specifically is tasked with, among other things, finding water on the lunar South Pole. Um, as I said, this is the gold standard. It is highly accurate. You know for certainty if water is present at that particular location, but it is logistically complex. You need to design the spectrometer and the detection instruments. You need to attach it to a rover. You need to design and build the rover. You need to launch it to the moon. You need to drive it around. There's a lot of different aspects that need to come into play. So again, it is very accurate, but it is expensive and very logistically complex. So we, we tend to do it rather sparingly. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Um, so the moon is not a great place to be. <laughs> it's very exciting and of course we love it, but it, it is a place that is not always the most welcoming in terms of its environment. Uh, so the moon really has no atmosphere to speak of. And so what that means is there's no thermal cushion to kind of ease the transition of temperatures between the night and the day um, or to kind of normalize them. And so what ends up happening is you get these very extreme temperature states on the lunar surface, depending where you are, and then these also extreme temperature differences, depending, again, on where you are on the surface and whether or not it's the day or the night at that particular time. Uh, so to give you some ideas to what we actually experienced there, um, in the equatorial regions, just, just at sunset, uh, the lunar temperatures can reach 135 degrees Kelvin or minus 138 degrees centigrade. And just before sunrise coming out of the night, you can hit temperatures of 100 Kelvin. Um, in polar regions, these temperatures are even more accentuated um, in the permanently set shadowed regions like we spoke about because there's no sunlight for millions or even billions of years. Temperatures, as you might imagine, are fairly low, uh, reaching as low as 40 degrees Kelvin. Um, now, during the lunar day, just at dawn, the temperatures are usually roughly, as we said, at uh, roughly 100 Kelvin. Um, but then again, because there's no atmosphere to kind of diffuse the sunlight that's coming into the surface, temperatures get very high, as high as 390 Kelvin or 117 degrees Celsius, so well above boiling point even at one Earth atmosphere, let alone at vacuum. Um, and that's right at the peak noon. And we'll talk a little bit more about what noon means on the moon because it's not necessarily intuitive. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, as I said, um, when we talk about day and night on the moon, it's not remotely the same as to how we talk about it on Earth. Um, so understand a little bit about this. Um, the reason, if you ever look at the, at the moon or the night sky or even at the day, if you can see it, you might notice that it's always the same face. It always looks the same. And there's a reason for that. The moon does rotate. Oh, sorry, I think we're changing slides a little bit here. Can we go back? Uh, I think one more to day and night. Ooh. Oh, we'll get there. Perfect, thank you. Um, sorry, yes, so so the moon does rotate about its axis, um, but what happens is the, the rate to which it rotates about its axis is the same that it rotates about the Earth. So that's, what's, that's what we call tidally locked. Um, and it's the reason why, again, we only ever see one face of the moon because it's kind of turning to face us as it moves about its orbit. 
Um, and if, you've, if you know a little bit about this, you know that the moon usually completes an orbit in roughly one Earth month, or here, you know, is uh, more accurately 29 and a half Earth days. Um, and 14 of those Earth days in the moon day, it's a bit complicated to wrap your head around, 14 of those Earth days are spent in the lunar night. Um, now, that's usually in the equatorial regions. That's a fairly, you know, accurate way of picturing it. But on the, in the lunar poles, that becomes a little bit different. So the, the day-night cycle is not exactly the same on the poles. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first of which is that, like the Earth, the moon has an axial tilt to it in its orbit. And this means that, like us, the moon experiences seasons. So depending on the time of year on the lunar surface, particularly, again, in the poles, um, the angle to which the sun is in the sky can be different. Sometimes it's below the horizon. Sometimes it's very high above. Uh, so similar to how we have in the Antarctic and in the Arctic, you'll have polar nights and polar days and all these different things on the moon. But what's a little bit different on the moon is that, again, um, the, the local topography can be a bit extreme in the poles. Uh, so depending on the time of year, if the sun is very low in the sky, and if you're in an area of the pole that has a lot of mountains or hills around it, even if the sun is in the sky, you're not going to have sunlight for an extended period of time. So it's incredibly variable and you have to know exactly where you are and what's around you in order to be able to determine whether or not you're in the night or whether or not you're in the day, even if technically the sun is above the horizon and you're in the day. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. We run some models for one particular location on the lunar south pole. Um, and at peak, we experience roughly 90 Earth days of darkness continuously. Um, and as you might imagine, this poses a rather uh, difficult challenge from an engineering perspective, particularly in the power generation and thermal control aspects. So 90 days of darkness um, means that you, you, you generally can't create power. Most power sources on the moon are solar in nature. Um, there is some discussion as to whether or not we would use um, some kind of nuclear reactor, but that's quite far away and is a rather extreme solution. Um, so we typically, when it becomes night, we either move to somewhere else that has light or we hunker down and just try to survive. Um, and this is also true from a thermal control perspective, as we've heard from the permanently shadowed regions, right? Um, these regions that don't get a lot of sunlight, like a location that has 90 days of continuous darkness, get very cold. And that means if you have an instrument or hardware that's on that site, you need to make sure you keep it warm so it doesn't die overnight. And that's of particular importance to your power storage media like batteries, which really don't like to go cold. So you have to make sure you have enough power to survive those night cycles. Uh, next slide, please. So if that weren't bad enough, uh, the moon dust itself is also a rather difficult thing to be navigating around. Um, so I'll give you a quick crash course on the, on the morphology here as to why we actually have this. Um, on Earth, if a meteorite impacts the ground, what will happen is it, you know, it'll hit, all the rock in the area will immediately liquefy from the force and the energy of the impact, and then it'll be shot into the air. Now, because you're at pressure on the, on the Earth's surface, you're at one atmosphere, um, it's good at kind of keeping it as a liquid. So the vapor pressure is high enough that, yes, it's boiling and it's doing all these things, but it's not going to immediately solidify. Um, and so by the time it reaches the ground, it's still more or less in that globule form. Maybe it's had some processes change, but it doesn't solidify too, too quickly. On the lunar surface, again, because there's no atmosphere, the vapor pressure deficit is, is very, very low. And so what happens is once the meteorite impacts the surface, these globules of ejector are flown into the air, um, they immediately solidify. And this, this shock of solidifying back into a solid so rapidly ends up shattering these globules into these very, very, very tiny pieces of what's essentially glass, um, usually about 0.1 micrometers in size. Um, and because it's shattered, what ends up happening is um, you get these very, very jagged edges. And so what happens is um, these regolith um, grains really like to embed themselves in equipment, in spacesuit fibers, and in, in tissue, unfortunately. So these are a lot of things that you have to consider because um, <laughs> it's nasty stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then the other thing is, again, because the moon does not have an atmosphere to speak of, nor does it have a magnetic field like we're lucky enough to have here on Earth, it's bombarded constantly by fairly strong solar wind. So solar wind usually is composed of um, ionizing particles. And what happens is when these particles impact the lunar surface and the regolith, it imparts a static charge. So not only does the regolith like to stick to things because it's sharp and embeds itself in, in the fibers of, of textiles uh, or of, of uh, mechanics, but it also sticks to things because there's a net charge difference and it likes to stick. Um, 
and and what I'm about to say will also tie into the toxicity and health hazards. Um, during the Apollo missions, when the astronauts would return to the LEM, uh, the lunar excursion modules, the spacecraft on the surface, and they would take off their suits, they found they had a, a heck of a time getting the regolith to come off. Not only because it, it would, you know, it would stick in the fibers because of its abrasive and sharp nature, but because when they remove it, it would just go stick back on because it was statically charged. So removing regolith from your systems is, is not a simple challenge, but it absolutely needs to be done. Not only because it can cause premature wear and tear to your hardware, but also because it's not good for human health. So the other aspect that the astronauts spoke about when they entered into the LEM and took off their suits is that they immediately were hit by a smell. Um, and that smell they likened to a NASCAR racetrack or burning rubber. Um, and that's generally a sign that there's some rather unpleasant compounds that are in whatever uh, area you're in. And they, they knew for a fact that it came from the, from the regolith. Um, and so human ingestion, be it through respiration or be it through drinking water contaminated with regolith grains, is uh, generally ill-advised, both because of the morphology, the fact that it can really affect tissues just from its structure, but also because of the compounds found within. So these are all things you're going to need to consider going forward. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for um, very informative and great presentations. Um, and also thank you to everyone who has already submitted their questions to the Q&A. Meg has been um, answering them as they come in. So thank you for that as well. I'm going to drop the email to um, for the challenge. If you have additional questions after, um, after this webinar, you can reach out there. And I'm also including a link to the Aqualunar application as well. So I'll just drop that in the chat for everyone. Um, I see that Reza has raised their hand, so. Okay. Um... Is it okay, Raza, if you can type your question in the Q&A? So the question is, how will the system, or how the system will be operated? Yes, um, I can provide a bit of an answer to that. So there, there, when you're de designing your system, you should plan for the system, the system to be um, remotely and essentially autonomously operated. But um, much of the onus, uh, is on uh, you as an innovator to tell us how the system will be operated. Um, but if you take a peek at the assessment criteria, that gives you a really good idea in terms of how we're evaluating all of the submissions um, to the challenge um, and remote operation is one of the assessment criteria. Um, so we'll be, um, if you can consider how the system can be designed to, to ideally also be uh, autonomously operated. Um, that would be incredibly helpful from a challenge perspective. Okay, there's a comment to answer the first question um, in the chat, and I, I responded saying, unfortunately, I can't. Um, we don't work uh, in that area, so don't have the knowledge or the expertise um, to effectively or appropriately answer that question. But please, any, any challenge prize related questions um, or uh, questions relating to the lunar surface, I'm, I can... Uh, if not answer today, get you an answer um, for sure. Um, I'm seeing a question here. Do you have to be in Canada to participate? So um, the challenge is actually launched in collaboration with uh, the UK Space Agency as well. So um, for applicants that are in the UK, please apply to the UK track of the challenge. Um, and then for our Canadian folks, uh, please apply to the Canadian track. Yes, the answer is um, the team should be from Canada. Uh, you are able to consult with folks that are outside of uh, of the country, but the person, um, the lead of the team um, that will be on the prize agreement must be a Canadian uh, within Canada. So on the regolith particle size, I'll have to get back to you. Um, it's a it's a technically specific question around regolith particulate, so I wouldn't feel comfortable answering um, myself today. Um, and then the second question on CSA planning, uh, testing and later rounds uh, around vacuum chambers and what other supports, uh, the answer is TBD. So we're already um, thinking and, and trying to figure out um, to make sure that we have the best non-financial supports in place for our innovators uh, and non-financial supports from a challenge prize perspective 
um, includes uh, testing uh, and validation of systems. So um, we are we have lots of pieces in the works to try to make sure that we have an incredible non-financial support package for all of the innovators that are applying and uh, that will be successful in stage one and, and building prototypes for stage two and stage three of the challenge. Meg, there's another question there um, from somebody who's in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so if if you team up uh, with folks uh, from within Canada, then you are able to uh, support a team. It's just that the um, the person that is named on our on our prize agreement must be a Canadian citizen. I see another question though around what comes after this challenge if there will be commercial opportunities. So. Um, what I can say is that challenge prizes have um, are really effective at increasing engagement, conversation, um, and potential opportunities for for folks that are applying to the challenge. So that is another piece that we're already starting to look at. And in our assessment criteria, we also talk about solution adoption potential. Um, so making sure that we're supporting teams um, to not only um, have that testing and validation support that they need, but also from uh, commercialization and scaling perspective. Um, so supporting teams uh, in past challenges, we've supported teams um, in developing business plans, for example. Um, so certainly considerations of all of our challenge prizes uh, when we are thinking about the development and uh, implementation of challenges. Uh, I might come at, <clears throat> um, might be able to answer two of the questions that I see. First of all, there's a recurring comment about selenium removal. I uh, don't think we've seen selenium on the moon, um, but regarding to selenium is a big problem in the mining sector, especially in British Columbia, and it's not easy to remove because it's always uh, with other uh, with other ions in the water. So there's currently a problem that we have on Earth, um, and there are a lot of people looking at it. It's not an easy problem to solve. Um, Regarding the other question about uh, is there any other filtration system currently used on the moon, then they're currently not. No? So we only send robots so far. So there's no there's no filtration system being currently used on the moon or anywhere else than Earth and the space station. All right. So I think that wraps up all of our, our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone who answered or pardon me, who submitted their questions and um, to the panelists for um, <clears throat> answering them. So if you have any um, challenge related questions, please feel free to reach out to Foresight at the email listed here, challenges at foresightcc.com. Uh, and we'll pass them along to the Canadian Space Agency, um, or you can contact them directly with the email um, that I dropped in the chat. Um, and with that, we will close this webinar and I hope, thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a wonderful day.